Next, we have Marnu van der Westhuizen. Marnu is uh, speaking on calculating the, the projected profits for an orchard planted on different rootstocks. So it's a bit of a different uh, focus than, than Pitman's, but also something which, which is very actual. Uh, Marnu has an MSc in Agriculture from Stellenbosch. He's uh, presently uh, the Research Implementation Manager at Hortgrow Science and is responsible for uh, technology transfer st for strategies. So is the link between industry and research quite a daunting task to uh, get the inf good information that is out there on the table of growers that are overloaded with, with uh, communication and uh, information. Marnu, thank you. Thanks, Andre. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Andre mentioned, I'm Marnu, and I think I would just like to first start off by thanking Piet Mann. I asked him um, this morning to not set the benchmark too high in terms of presentations for today, but now he did, so hopefully I'll be able to um, receive and pass on the baton uh, successfully to the next speakers, which is the panel discussion I think all of us are looking forward to. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my talk today, as Andre mentioned, is on the projected profits for orchards um, planted to different rootstocks based on rootstock evaluation data, so based on our completed industry rootstock trials. And um, I must say, when I was um, preparing for today and making this presentation, I realized that that title is way too long, 13 words to be exact, so I struggled to fit it on a page. But basically what it means in short, what we try to illustrate with this um, project is the potential financial benefit one can gain um, from selecting the best or the most optimum rootstock for your specific site. So that's just in short what we looked at. Um, and obviously in this sort of project, there's a lot of financials. Um, me being a horticulturist, definitely not an economist. Um, I must say, <clears throat> working through this project, getting the results, it brought quite a good of perspective in terms of the whole the whole picture, the bigger picture, the bigger scheme of things. And I hope you can gain some value uh, from the results we got. So to kick off, um, as an introduction, as all of us know, farming is like building this massive, annually building this massive big complex puzzle, consisting of a lot of pieces, which includes stuff like irrigation, soil, climate, science, labor, and, and at the end of the day, your root stocks. And the end game with this puzzle, like any other puzzle, is to try and fit all the pieces in the most optimum way in each other. <clears throat> so that they marry each other and you end up with this magnificent successful puzzle, or obviously um, on the farming side. The part I looked at was the good stocks, specifically good stock selection. And as, as we know, you more than me, good stock selection is a very complex, in itself is a very complex process um, that's determined by a bunch of, or a multitude of factors. Some of these um, determining factors include your parentage and your plant attributes, um, soil and climatic preferences, and obviously your soil texture preferences. Um, a, a important one, the resistance of the nematode, to nematodes and diseases. And then lastly, um, something that sometimes plays a major role or a big role is the cost of the trees. So it's a lot of factors, it's a lot to digest, a lot to process to just get to the optimal rootstock um, and a difficult process. Um, and fortunately, the work of the late Dr. Pete Stassen, uh, who this project, project uh, is based on, on his results, allowed, uh, made this process of selecting a rootstock a bit easier by giving us the results that we could use to compile these characteristics tables. Uh, for each of the determining factors. So in parent parentage and plant attributes, we have different soil and climatic preferences for different rootstocks. We have, uh, there's um, soil texture preferences for each rootstock, and then um, obviously also lost the status of each rootstock in terms of its resistance to nematodes and diseases. And, I uh, and Shaul um, Stander will be giving a bit, uh, on Friday at the Stonefield Field, they will, will talk a bit more on this and elaborate more on this with a very insightful overview or summary um, based on Pete's data that we used, but also based on practical observations and experience, which I think is very important to link those two 
to each other. So you'll be giving a very nice talk on that on Friday. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a lot. It's a lot to digest. And the end goal or the end aim would be to try and tick all the boxes in each of those determining factors um, in hopefully the correct fashion to end up at the end of the day hitting that bullseye and selecting the, op the most optimum good stock for your specific site with the most optimum characteristics. However, what sometimes happens is that somewhere along that selection process, we end up selecting maybe a wrong box, ticking the wrong box, or what also sometimes happens is that the emphasis or the focus is put on that last one, the cost of the trees. And obviously, a more expensive tree reflects in a more, uh, a more expensive establishment cost, and naturally, like everything, like all of us do in life, we steer away from the more expensive option, opting for the cheaper one. So it um, doesn't really matter where the box is wrongly ticked. At the end of the day, one runs the risk of, of missing that bullseye for your, for your circumstances and selecting a third or e the second or even the third best option for your specific site and then going on that, that cross route at the bottom. And this is done without necessarily always considering or knowing the, the long-term benefit your decision holds, the long-term benefit your selection or the good stock you selected will hold. And that brings me to the objective of this study, and that was to try and provide or illustrate the long-term benefits you get from selecting the specific good stock. How we did this was by building a theoretical financial model that projects the potential long-term profit of a plum orchard planted to the most optimum good stock to, at the end of the day, hopefully, indicate the importance of selecting the correct rootstock for your specific site. And I've put the project in brackets because um, this is obviously a theoretical projection. It's based on actual data that we extracted from the rootstock trials, but we also used industry average figures, we used modeled figures, um, and I think if we look at the results, it should, it should just be interpreted as such, um, as a projection, as a... Um, as a model that looked at figures in advance in the future. Okay, just quickly the how, which basically is the materials and methods for this project. We used four completed industry plum rootstock trials, um, two African delight orchards with 10 and 11 different rootstocks respectively, and then a Letitia orchard, 14 different rootstocks, and then lastly a Sunbridge orchard with 12 different rootstocks. And what we then did is we went into each of those orchards and selected a, key, a few key rootstocks um, that we used for the projection to try and illustrate the message we tried to, to bring with this, this project. In terms of the data, we use it a lot. Um, I'll just quickly go through that. Um, in terms of the establishment cost, we use actual tree and royalty cost and industry averages for all the other relevant expenses. On yield data, we had the first few years of yield, yield data, depending on the site, it was either till year four or five that we extracted from the rootstock trials, and the rest of the lifespan of the orchard, let's say from year six to 20, we used two-year averages <coughs> just to get an idea. Then on uh, fruit size distributions, we used the average size data from the completed industry rootstock trials, and that was fitted to a four-year industry average, almost like the normal distribution, um, fruit size distribution of each cultivar. Then on fruit quality, we assume uniform good fruit quality for this model. And then on pack out percentages, we, just, it, we, were, we based it on a four-year industry average per um, cultivar. And then just lastly, in terms of fruit pricing, a weighted average um, prices per equivalent carton were used that we sourced from a fruit data um, study group. So that was the, the data we used for this model. And obviously with a, with a project like this, we have to have some assumptions, financial assumptions. And um, this included an inflation of 5%, which we applied on both the income and expenses side. Loan amounts were, um, I've never heard that word before, but I knew it, I know it now after this project, amortized at prime, 7.75% at that time, with a two-year grace period. And then a 15-year loan term was assumed with a tax payment of 28%. So that was the financial assumptions we made. Um, I think the, the noteworthy assumptions we've, we've made. All right, so that's the data, that's the financial assumptions, and finally we get to the interesting part, the part I enjoyed, which was the results. Um, and I'll jump into it um, directly. The first orchard was the African Delight Orchard in the Zamondian region, and the two neat noteworthy characteristics of this site that we should take note of is that it was a low-lying sa low sandy soil with fluctuating water tables, 
and then also had high numbers of ring nematodes. So that's the key things we need to remember if we look at the projection. In terms of the orchard details, um, planting distance 4.5 by 0.75, and the training system was a V system. And obviously with the fluctuating water tables, especially in the winter season with the rain, some orchard preparations was done. So a drainage system was installed on this site with um, trees planted on the ridges, 0.5 by 1.5 meter ridges, and then also cut some cut-off furrows were dug to prevent the lateral flow of water in that intense precipitation circumstances. And that's eventually, after all the, the processing of the data, that's eventually what we end up with, the projection. And this is how it looks for each of the sites. Um, it's a clump safer keys in a clump liner, and it must be a lot of work to go. But I think, if you look at that, it's quite self-explanatory. And I'll just try to highlight some of the key things we, we extracted and we got from the, from the projections. Just be quickly before we look at the projections, in terms of the layout, on the y-axis, we have the cumulative profit. Um, on the x-axis, obviously, the lifespan of the orchards indicated yearly. Up, we used 20 years for the lifespan in this uh, instance. And then if we look at the lines, the solid lines um, represents the actual data, the actual yield and fruit size data we extracted from, from Dr. Pete's work. And those dashed lines that fade way up into till year 20 represents the projected data. So that was the theoretical assumed with the data we got from the model. And then the last thing just to note is that um, the legend indicates the rootstock we selected in each site, and all of those roots, all of the legends are ordered from the best performance to the lo to the lowest performance in terms of cumulative profit. So if the lines are a bit confusing or small, you can use just just use the legend to guide you in terms of performance. Okay, so this first site, remember sandy soils, ring nematodes. If you look at the data, and we start off with the establishment cost. There was really very little difference between the establishment cost of the key root stocks that we looked at. It, it varied between 40 to 60,000 rands starting in year one. But um, all in all, I think really little, very little difference between them. Then if we move on and we jump to the, to the cumulative profit at the end, it was a quite close battle between the top three contestants, Maridon, Atlas, and Mariana, with all three of them um, reaching between four, five and five and a half million rands cumulative profit after 20 years. And then if we just jump back to the break-even points, Maridona and Mariana managed to reach it by year nine, whereas Atlas only got there a year later at year 10. Then um, in terms of Viking, came in fourth place on this projection, but with, uh, with I think just above four and a half million rands, but with, but with um, Viking's performance <coughs> declining uh, or, or used to decline in, after year 8 to 10 in sandy soils, this line in real life would have probably looked a bit different, a bit lower than what we got in this projection. That is something to note in these results. I think all in all, if we look at the top three, the top three good socks, Maridon, Atlas, and Mariana, if I zoom in in that last little section, um, these results really concurred with what Dr. Pete Sasson found in his trials, and that was that Maridon and Mariana performed well in the specific circumstances, but with this site having high ring nematode numbers, um, it would have probably obviously requ required nematocyte treatment, which we didn't factor in, and would obviously also affect that end amount. Whereas with Atlas, it proved to be a good choice, um, as it was able to handle the sandy soils and also be moderately tolerant to ring nematodes. So all in all, on this specific site, Atlas was a very good option if we look at the data. Okay, if we jump to the to the second site, again an African delight orchard, this time around in Robertson region. Um, the two characteristics here to note is that it was a calcareous soil, sandy soil with a pH of 7.6, 7 and again high, high ring nematode numbers with this specific site. The orchard details differed a bit, 5.5, 5.75, but the training system was the same, also a V system. And this is how the projection looked. And this is one of my favorite ones, because obviously it made the most money, but um, if you look at Pete's work, Pete, Dr. Stassen's results, and compare to this that we found, this was really one of the better performing site, sites that he, he investigated. Um, I think for the, some of the key root stocks, we looked at the average tonnage per hectare in the first few years, over the first few years, was around 50 to 60 tons. So that was a high producing orchard, and I think that obviously reflects in the, in the cumulative profit as we used um, averages to project the rest of the lifespan's or, um, yields. Nevertheless, if we look at the projection, 
Uh, again, it's very small. I, th I don't think we can really see it, but that just indicates a small difference in establishment cost in the beginning. Then if we move on to the break-even points in this instance, GF677 and Mariana um, reached yeah, the, the zero line by year six. Kahneman Atlas and Sapo 778 got there a year later in year seven. Fast forward 20 years, and this is how the cumulative profit looked. Um, GF and Kahneman outperformed the rest, um, so quite substantially being almost 11 and 10 and a half million respectively. I think the yellow line is a bit difficult to see, but yeah, the Kahneman ended up at 10 and a half. And um, important to note here is that in this observation show that African Delight Plum struggled to develop good color on GF in this specific site circumstances. So obviously that line in real life would also be a bit different, most probably a bit lower. But, um, but yeah, that's what we got in this projection with the assumptions we made. Then Mariana came in third, I think just above nine million rands if I look on the screen. And I think ring, nem ring nematodes uh, probably played a role here. There wasn't nematocyte treatments on this site. So that probably played a big role with its performance. And then lastly, um, I just want to quickly refer to SARPA 778. Um, SARPA being as sensitive to calcareous soils and also having a high chill requirement um, came in last. And I think that was to be expected if you look at the characteristics of this site. Uh, where it was situated and also the, the circumstances um, within this site. All in all, I think the takeaway message I took from this specific site was, was that little hands, um, which means that this site was a really good example of where a, um, a very little difference in your initial expense or your initial investment results in a massive difference at the end of the day in your income given that you select the, the optimum, most optimum rootstock for your specific site. So this, this, this site just really indicated how big that difference can be um, over the lifespan of the orchard. Then, third, third site, Letitia Orchard in Stellenbosch region. Um, I'll go a bit quicker. It was a clay soil, so a bit different. Again, ring nematodes and the orchard details you can see is 3.25 per 1.5 in the Palmet system. And with this site, um, apart from the establishment cost, the noteworthy thing here was that the Viking and Philin M uh, managed to reach a break-even point by year 11, and the rest followed from there. So I think that was the one of the noteworthy things I, I got from this one. And obviously, if we look at the cumulative profit with this site, this site being a Salem Bosch, the chances of it being an old vineyard soil is very high. So obviously, that, so that type of soil is prone to show more fungal and bacterial activity. And Viking being tolerant to pathogens, tolerant to sensitive to ring nematodes, and also suitable for clay soils, it wasn't a surprise that it, that it uh, performed best on this specific site, followed by Philinem. And then Mariana came in at fifth place, uh, with it being very sensitive to bacterial and fungal infections and ring nematodes. If we look at the, the last site, uh, Sunbury's Orchard, also in the Stellenbosch region, these two sites were on the same block. It was planted in alternative rows. So, um, the, the circumstances, the characteristics is, is identically the same. But if you look at the projection, um, similar results were found. So here, Florida God came in first, um, five and a half million, followed by Viking, and then lastly, Sapo 7, ach, third place, Sapo 7, 7, 8. But what was noteworthy here was that Florida God being a quite strong grower, quite um, strong vigor, um, it obviously meant that it was quick out of the blocks in that first few years, that first um, four to five years. But with Florida God preferring a more lighter soil, and this was a clay sort of type of soil, um, this line would have obviously also been um, lowered a bit in real life, which means that Viking would have had a, a higher, higher spot on that rankings, concurring with what we found in the same site just before um, that I mentioned prior. Then lastly, Mariana came in last, and obviously ring nematodes may, most probably played a role here, and also the potential um, activity, fungal and bacterial activity. And that was the four sites. I think, obviously, there's a lot of data, a clomp cipher, a clomp getalle, and I think we can actually extract even more from this type of projections. Um, if we fine tweak the model a bit, we can get even more information uh, from this. But for me, if I had to go and summarize a few key points from these four predictions, uh, a sort of take-home message 
Um, firstly, I would say that it, uh, something that m most probably all of us know, but this project has reiterated that again, or the results, is that rootstock selection is really site specific. Um, each site is unique, each site has unique circumstances, unique characteristics, and it should be treated as such. Then the second point um, was that if we look um, at the cumulative profit, and we look at the difference between the cumulative profit at the end of the day, between the rootstocks within a site, it was very clear that nowadays, rootstock selection is nearly as vital as your cultivar selection. Then, um, the, thir the, the third point, um, and this was just looking at that second side, if we consider that difference, the small difference in the investment cost that results in this massive difference in income, this point was very clear that one should not let the choice of what you plant be determined solely by the cost of planting it. It should be a, it should be a factor to consider, but it should, it should not be solely the determining, determining thing. And this goes hand in hand with the last point, which was to consider the long-term effect and benefit or benefit a rootstock will hold. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the best thing would still be to consider all four of those factors with your technical advisor when selecting a rootstock for your specific um, site and its edaphic and climatic um, profile. So that would be, from my side, the take-home messages we got from those projections. Um, that's my story. I would just like to thank a few people and colleagues that collaborated and helped me on this project, especially Colella, who was the numbers man behind this. Um, we are busy with Nectarine, so that data would also be available, and obviously we will make all these, these um, projections data also available. Thanks very much.